So uh, welcome to Brown Bag History for January 17th, 2024. As we begin, we acknowledge that the land around Revelstoke and on the Columbia River and its tributaries is the Sanak's homeland and traditional territory. We acknowledge the ties of the Sequitmec, the Okanagan Nation Alliance, and the Tanaha to this land. We acknowledge our use and inhabitation of this land sacred to these four nations. We respectfully honor their traditions and culture. Um, so uh, we're going back to, uh, well, first of all, I will uh, confess that this is actually my 41st anniversary. Uh, last year was my 40th because I started working here in 1983, but we didn't get around to having the celebration until now. So uh, we'll just ignore the fact that we're a year late. Um, but the interesting thing is that I found an old journal entry from exactly um, 41 years ago that I wrote, January 17th, 1983. I was told of a job opening today, a grant position at the museum for two months. It's a full-time short-term job and the pay is lousy, <laughs> but I really want the job. In my resume, I have to say why I want to work at the museum. I would like to work in the museum because of my need to know the history of my local. This is not my native home, but my husband's family has been here for many years and they have imbued in me a great interest in Revelstoke's past. I know how history can shape our lives. What has gone before determines what will come after. Even for those of us who weren't born in the city, its history affects us. It is important to know what forces and influences shape the town in the past so that we can be aware of the same influences and forces in our day. A person is not separate from their place. They're local. Neither are they separate from their past, this or that of their own family or of the place they live in. History is not dead. Everything is connected. And that is why I want to work in the museum. And that's why I'm still here 41 years later, because I, <laughs> I still believe that. Um, and I'm here really because of this woman, Ruby Knobs, uh, who was born in Revelstoke in 1907. And she'd been involved with the museum society since its inception in 1958 and was involved in really forming one of the people who formed the museum, got it going along with people like Mary Dame and um, Doris Dame, Margaret McMahon, many others who were really involved in the formation of this place and really lobbied to get this building in 1974 um, when the city purchased it from the federal government after its use as a post office. So uh, she was really amazing. She had a steel trap memory. People think my memory is good, not a patch on hers. She was just phenomenal. Um, and I learned, learned a lot from her. But uh, you notice where we're sitting there. Uh, that's actually where the office is now. Uh, because for probably the, the first uh, 30 years that we were in this building, we were kind of just making it, making you, making do with the post office building. And it wasn't until 2004 that we created the front that area that we have now in the gift shop area. So it's been a, a long, slow process. Um, over the years, I think, you know, I've really, really been influenced by the people that I've met. And, um, you know, people ask me why I love working here and it's because of the connections that I've made with people. And this man here is a man named T.E.L. Taylor. And the man on the right is his grandson, uh, Tom Taylor, who lives, lived in West, West Vancouver. And um, Tom and his wife, Margaret, came into the museum. Probably I'd only been working here a couple of years or so, so mid eighties. And uh, Tom said, I'm looking for information on my grandfather. He was an early pioneer, early businessman in Revelstoke. And I said, oh, is that T.E.L. Taylor? And he said, yes, how did you know that? I said, well, because you look like him. <laughs> and uh, we had, we've had we had a lifelong friendship since then. Um, Tom and Margaret would come and visit every year until their health got such that they weren't able to come anymore. But uh, Tom just passed away this last October. But we said we still do Christmas cards. Margaret and I still exchange Christmas cards. and. That's been a you know a friendship for um, over 35 years just from that chance visit, and actually I've done that another time too. There was a fellow came in and said he was looking for information on his great grandfather who was a minister in Revelstoke, and he wasn't sure whether we would have anything or not. And I said, oh well, was it C. H. Procunior? 
and he said, yes, how did you know? And I said, because you look like him. <laughs> and that really astounded him because he had never seen a picture of his great grandfather because there'd been a split between his grandfather and great grandfather. And he didn't even know until just before his visit here that his grand great grandfather had actually lived in Revelstoke. So it was a whole whole discovery. So it's that it hasn't happened a lot, but it's pretty fun when they can do that and surprise people. Um, this is an, another uh, family that that came. The couple on the left are uh, Jim uh, Mundy and his wife, and they had come from the States uh, to find out information on his grandfather who had founded the Mundy Lumber Sawmill at uh, Three Valley. And Ruby right away called this gentleman in Vancouver and said, you need to get up here because his name was Mundy McRae. And he was named after this man's grandfather um, because their his uh, Mundy McRae's father, uh, Alex McRae, and Mr. Mundy had been partners in the lumber business. So the youngest son got named after after Mundy. Um, so another just amazing encounter with with locals. Uh, this is one that I was really excited about. Um, the man is uh, Lawrence Haltengren. And he came in and he said, um, my uncle moved to, to Revelstoke in the 1880s, but he probably, I think he went by a different name. I think he went by the name Charles Holton. Well, I got really excited about that because you know the, the Holton house at the end of First Street West and the Holtons were you know, very prominent family here, but he was kind of a mystery man. And when I tried to research him, like in the, the census records and that, his, um, date of birth, his place of birth, his nationality changed in every single record. Uh, so there with the, with the nephew, we were able to find out that he was, when he was born, he was born in Sweden, not in the States as he had, had noted. Uh, his actual name was Carl Holtengren. Um, so we found, got all this information just on that chance visit. And this happens all the time and is still happening. And I love it when that happens, when they get people coming in and we make those connections and I'm able to help them with information and they're able to help us with information. It's just a wonderful circle. Um, this is probably, I've been in the paper a lot. I'm not crazy about having my picture in the, in the paper, but it happens a lot, part of the, part of the job. Um, but this is probably my favorite picture um, in the article. Uh, that's the, the grizzly bear that was uh, donated. It was actually left to the museum in somebody's will. And um, so we have the had it in the collection, but for a long time it was uncovered. So people were touching it all the time. And the caption says, to be properly protected, Kathy English, museum curator, said this bear should be enclosed in glass, but a do not touch sign is a short-term measure. And I like the way that was written because if you get rid of the words said this bear, I like the way that reads. To be properly protected, Kathy English Museum curator should be enclosed in glass. <laughs> um, this was probably our first uh, heritage walking tour in uh, probably about 1985, 87, and uh, led a, a group. Um, I think we did kind of the courthouse uh, direction at that time. And uh, so we've been doing walking tours ever since. Uh, I think in 90, 80, 80, maybe 87. And this was our first Victorian tea in uh, 1987. Uh, we used to have you know, set up tea tables in the museum. And the uh, girl in the yellow skirt is Jacqueline Daniluk, who, uh, who went on to do a lot of projects together when she was working for Parks Canada and is still a really close friend. I was her first boss. And uh, this was kind of what our muse what our exhibits looked like back then. Uh, we had that uh, horrible brown pegboard, which we finally got rid of, um, and the old linole battleship linoleum. But that's uh, this was a sports display, and um, this wasn't my first sports display. But the when I first got the job here uh, in 1983, it was I mentioned it was a grant position because the rail the museum had gotten some funding to do an exhibit um, in conjunction with the BC Winter Games, which are being held in Revelstoke. So we had the, um, they got money to hire a couple of people to do an exhibit on sports history. 
So I got the job based on that stellar resume that I wrote um, along with uh, Gwen Eady and we put together an exhibit. And then that summer, the person who had been running the museum in the summer was uh, was leaving. So they asked me if I would fill in for the summer. And at that, that time we were only open in the summer. And then that year they were able to find some additional funding and asked me if I would stay on. Um, Mandy doing research for the uh, Glimpses of the Past article found one where the it said the Historical Society was saying that um, they were hoping that Kathy English would come back as their curator uh, in the spring because they thought she would be excellent in that position. So um, I guess I was. <laughs> um, this was an event that we did at the community center um, on um, March 1st, 1989 for the 90th anniversary of Revel Stokes Incorporation. And uh, Ruby and I are both wearing historic pieces. We put together a little bit of a panel exhibit back then when really all we had to deal work with was the like poster board and, um, and typing out the captions. Um, there's uh, my daughter, Sarah, who is uh, just over a year old there. And, and we had the wicker carriage from the collection. And we were in the, this was the 1992 uh, parade float that we were in along with uh, Ruby and the summer student that year, Diana Polillo, and Vern Edity playing one of his uh, antique pianos from the piano key. So that was uh, Sarah's first public appearance in a museum event. <laughs> and uh, this was this this was before the, the Heritage Garden was built. It was just an alley, but they were doing a flag raising at one of the Victorian teas. And uh, some of the, are the members of the, the museum at the time. And Sarah's just kind of in the corner there. <laughs> so that'd be about probably 1995, to be about four there, three or four. And another parade float. We don't do them every year. It's a lot of work to do, but we've done a few parade floats and Sarah's featured in a couple of them. And uh, this was the uh, 100th anniversary of Revel Stoke in uh, 1999. And uh, this was also 1999. This is that's the year that uh, that uh, Ruby retired at the end of that year. Um, she was 91 at the time, and um, she'd already written her book, His Revel Stoke History and Heritage, which is we still have uh, available. And um, that was the year that we were able to get control of the whole building. Before that, we'd shared it with the art group and established the archives room up here, which is called the Ruby Knobs Community Archives. Uh, the quilt in the background was done by one of our members, uh, Liz Barker, who made that as a raffle for the Centennial Project for the Rebel Stokes 100. And the other woman there, of course, is uh, Elsie uh, Jameson, who was a long-term member of the, the museum. I believe we had her 90th birthday party here when she turned 90 as well. And of course, the Heritage Garden was uh, really an amazing community project. That was uh, Liz Barker, the same person who did the quilt. She came up with the idea of turning the alleyway into a garden. So we started that project, started planning for it in 2001, and it opened in July of 2004. Uh, we were lucky to be able to get uh, Barb Davidson, um, as uh, she was a landscape architect, to do the, the, the site plan for us. And um, a lot of the, other than the infrastructure, a lot of the work was done by volunteers. And there we are laying the sod. The volunteers did all the planting. Uh, the volunteers uh, still led by Leslie and Linda are still maintaining the Heritage Garden almost uh, we, the 20th anniversary this year. So it's an incredible community and volunteer effort and it created a lovely green space there. Um, this is an exhibit that we ran from 2014 to 2018, um, in, but um, about World War One. So we did it for the hundredth anniversary of the beginning, from the beginning to the end of, of World War One. But a really uh, strong feature of that was memory books uh, that were created by my husband Ken, who spent hours and hours and hours of research, both on the Library and Archives Canada database of World War I soldiers, and also on uh, the, going through the newspaper. He read every single newspaper 
um, from 1914 to 1918 and a bit beyond as well, and created a profile on each of the 100 soldiers from here who died. So it's an incredible research project that's still an important part of what we have available now, and it's, that's, uh, it's on our website now, the, the memory books. Uh, this was another uh, amazing event um, uh, for the 100th anniversary of the um, first recorded climb of Mount Bigby in 2007. There was a bunch of events that happened, including uh, a, 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 re a recreated climb. So Rob Buchanan and Angus Woodman and several others uh, did the climb on the same weekend. And it was, in, it was in June, so there was still snow up there. And they had some pretty interesting adventures on, on their climb. The Lieutenant Governor came as part of that, that ceremony. That was probably one of the first uh, big uh, panel exhibits that we did as well. Uh, we had panels on the history of, of Mount Begbie. That's when we were moving from just having lots of shelves with lots of artifacts to moving towards the storytelling model and having panels sort of telling the story of different aspects of our community. So that was probably one of the first. Of course, it was the design work was done by Rob Buchanan, who's been really instrumental in a lot of what we've done here over the years. Um, one of our big exhibits, first really big exhibit that we did was Chinese Legacies. And I was asked by, by the Railway Museum to curate an exhibit for them on the history of the Chinese workers on the railway. Uh, so uh, I did a lot of research on that and that research is still used by, by myself and by other researchers. I've shared it quite a bit and uh, created the exhibit for them. And then at the same time, we decided that we should do an exhibit here on the Chinese community in Revelstoke. So we had that up for several years in this room. Uh, this is uh, Jim Kwong uh, with me at the podium there. And he was the uh, youngest uh, son of uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kwong who had, uh, were a really prominent early Chinese family here. They had a, a laundry right where the senior center is now. And um, another big highlight was the visit of uh, James Baring, who's sixth Baron Revelstoke and the great grandson of the Lord Revelstoke that we're named after, for the first Lord Revelstoke. And he was invited to come to Revelstoke's homecoming in 2009. And we put together an exhibit on, called it From Farwell to Revelstoke. And it included quite a bit about the, the history of the, the burying of, of the family, the Revelstoke family. Uh, very interesting. He was a fascinating man. Um, he had, um, was, he was living in France for quite a few years and he'd started probably the first organic vineyards in, in, in Europe. Um, and uh, he was also, at one point, he owned the uh, studio in uh, Abbey Road where the Beatles and Rolling Stones recorded some of their music. So he was involved in the early music scene. He was a, a pioneer in uh, aviation in the UK and um, was also a pioneer in the establishment of the protocols for the internet. So very, very interesting man. He had opinions on absolutely everything. Um, he was everything that you would expect a British Lord to be. So he didn't disappoint in that. A really, really lovely fellow. Um, this this um, picture sort of leads into a really big story and probably one of what I consider one of the most important projects that we've done here at the museum. Uh, I met with, uh, this was a contact through, came through the Japanese consulate and they had contacted a man in Kamloops who was part of the Japanese community. And he'd contacted me because his family was wanting to come and see where their great uncle had died. And that's their, the great uncle was one of the victims of the 1910 March 4th uh, snow slide. So uh, they made a, a few visits here and it was really meeting them that made us think about doing a big commemoration for the 100th anniversary of the, the, of the, the snow slide. And um, so as a result of that, we worked with the, uh, uh, Parks Canada, Friends of Mount Revelstoke and Glacier, the Railway Museum, uh, CP, City of Revelstoke, and did this incredible commemoration. There were probably about 800 people there at the, the plaza because we had 500 candles and they ran out and uh, 
right near the beginning of, of the, the ceremony. Um, you can see the, the cranes there. There were more than 10,000 paper cranes that were made by people in Revelstoke, people in Japan, people all across Canada, all the school kids, all everybody in the care homes, the um, militia, the military at, uh, located at Rogers Pass, everybody was involved in that. And uh, we actually walked the, the cranes from the parks office up, up to Mackenzie Avenue and up to the plaza uh, where they were strung across there. And um, when we walked them, we were there was about 10 people that had to carry them because they were such a long string and they were so heavy. And the Yamaji family uh, preceded us uh, that wearing their in their traditional in their kimonos that preceded us up to the plaza. Um, in when the event happened back in 1910, all of the uh, ceremonies were were Christian, but we included a Buddhist ceremony as part of the the ceremony for the commemoration to honor the 30. Uh, 32 Japanese men who had died as a part of the 58. Um, it was very, very moving. Uh, there were so many moments of um, just sort of grace um, and th th unexpected moments. Uh, we had two people reading off the names of all of the men who died. And the person who was reading all of the, the names of the Caucasian workers, uh, her name was Julie Lawson, who's a children's author. and her grandfather was the roadmaster on the accident and her great uncle was one of the men who died. So the very first name that she read and they were alphabetical order, so this was not planned. The very first name that she read was her great uncle. And Mr. Yamaji was reading the Japanese names. The very last name that he read was his great uncle. It was just one of those moments that sort of sent shivers up us because it was completely unplanned and unexpected, but, um, I, th I think with this one, it made me realize that honoring people's memories is probably one of the most important things we can do at the museum. And this was probably the, the best example of that and how that, how that uh, came about. And it was continued in the summer when the um, Parks Canada created a memory garden at Rogers Pass. And uh, there were, by that time, there were other Japanese families who'd other, also come out for the event and participated in it. And then that evening, there was uh, uh, lanterns that were let out into the, the river at the boat launch. And each one of them had the names of one of the, the men who had died in the accident in the event. So uh, again, very, very moving. And uh, it just really felt like we were honoring the spirits of the people who had died. Another big event we had was in 2010. It was the 125th anniversary of uh, uh, Farwell. And we had a big event down in the park. We had uh, old fashioned kids races and uh, uh, all sorts of things going on down there, activities. Uh, there's Haley there, <laughs> who was our project manager for that. Um, Peter Waters was our town crier. Uh, a lot of people, we, a lot of people really had fun with this one. We did a royal tea for the uh, wedding of Prince William and Kate Middleton on April 29th, 2011. And uh, so we were encouraging people to wear dress up and wear hats and fascinators. So people didn't disappoint us. They really had fun with that. Did a little display about the, the royal family. And um, Mary Lee Flandon, who was our office manager at the time, was uh, doing a lot of the planning for, for that event. So that was a really fun one. Now, I think this is probably our first Jose cake <laughs> that we had. I tell people that we only do exhibits so that we can have uh, an exhibit opening with a cake by Jose. Um, and um, so I think the first one that she did was for our David Thompson exhibit. And again, that was one of our early panel exhibits. And we still have that one out in the hallway here. And um, that uh, cake, the, we have um, uh, waves made out of jello. And there's actually birch bark around the edges of the cake and uh, a, a yeah, little little canoe, cedar canoe. So um, yeah, that, uh, it, but it was, it was a significant exhibit too. Uh, I was working at that time with uh, designer uh, Catherine Whiteside. She did a lot of our, our early exhibits. 
Um, and uh, so, as I say, it's still out there and is just a really important part of the history of this region. So it was um, sort of the beginnings of learning how to do panel exhibits and tell, that, tell those stories. Um, of course, we've done a couple of books over, over the years. The first one was Reflections of uh, photographs of Earl and Estelle Dickey. And then in 2011, we did the first tracks book, uh, which also uh, turned into an exhibit as well. And uh, there's, we actually had like a conveyor belt going down the stairs with people passing the books all the way down because uh, we had uh, 2000 books. So it took a while to get them all into the building. And uh, it also spawned a cartoon by Rob Buchanan. And I'm always really excited when we managed to get a Rob Buchanan cartoon. This one says, is that the lineup for opening week at the ski hill? No, it's the lineup to get a copy of the museum's coffee table book on the history of skiing in Rumbleton. Um, we did uh, an event uh, for the Diamond Jubilee of uh, Queen Elizabeth in July of uh, 2012. We did it kind of uh, 50s uh, style. And uh, of course there was nobody better to, we did, I did a little uh, script with the, uh, with the Queen talking about her visits to Revelstoke and nobody better to do that than Helen Grace. Although she decided not to use her British accent, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> um, and there's with uh, Cheryl Walgram on that same day, we had uh, the Vintage Car Club did a display with some of their vehicles from the 1950s era. And again, it was just a you know, fun event, lots of people involved in that we had our our uh, kids the, from the, the children's program involved in doing some some songs, uh, just, a, just a lot of fun. We had Terry and Venka Beidel teaching people how to do swing, swing dance, uh, so just lots of fun. In uh, April 28, 2014, we did the 100th anniversary of Mount Revelstoke National Park. Uh, I've got Fred Olson and his two granddaughters they're admiring the cake. Fred was the grandson of the first uh, warden of the park, Fred Maunder. And I believe that's another Jose cake there. <laughs> yeah, the, with the, the mountains, they're, yeah, they're absolutely fabulous. This was the same date. It was pouring rain, the end of April, but it was extremely cold. So everybody was a little bit miserable doing this outside. And then they came in to see the, the exhibit. And this is where we have our Land of Thundering Snow exhibit now, the, the same area. And there's again, Helen Grace looking at the, at the exhibit. Um, there's Mark McKee, the mayor at the time. Mark's here today. And Peter Scherer at the launch of Land of Thundering Snow exhibit, March 4th, 2015. Peter Scherer was uh, really a legend in the world of avalanche research. He just passed away a lot, year, year before last and is well into his 90s. But he, uh, he came to uh, Glacier in the 1950s as part of a, a team that was looking at the avalanche mitigation for the Trans-Canada Highway that was going to go in on that route and uh, was, uh, really instrumental in all of the, the, the measures that are in place now. And he did that sort of throughout the province, wherever there's avalanche mitigation, he had a hand in that. And uh, so he came up for, for the opening of the, the exhibit. He was in his late eighties at the time. Uh, he drove up by himself from the coast. He stopped along the way to do, uh, 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 I think before he came here, he'd gone up on the at Mount Revelstoke to do, a, or Mount Mackenzie to do a couple of ski runs before he came to the event. But uh, really a remarkable person. Um, and then this was, we did a launch, a soft launch of the website that night at the Performing Arts Center. And there's John Woods, who was the writer and researcher of Land of Thundering Snow. And um, really we couldn't have done it without John. Um, and he's still you know, updating, keeping that uh, the map updated. Um, Haley was our project manager on that. I think um, she had uh, two babies in the time that it took us to uh, to get the website up and running. But um, it was it it really it's still a project that's uh, really stood the test of time. The website is used a lot, and it's really an incredible resource. And the exhibit is still really popular in the museum. 
Um, and as a result of that, we uh, the the project was nominated for an award at the Canadian Museums, and I was able to go to Halifax in uh, 2016 to accept the award. And the uh, ceremonies were held at uh, Pier 21 uh, Immigration Museum, and uh, that's their mascot. So I got to uh, to meet the the museum mascot there. Um, I've, uh, since I started working here, you know, of course, uh, right from the beginning, we were aware of sort of the importance of Nels Nelson in the development of skiing in, in Revelstoke. And um, Nelson and his wife had 10 children. And um, over the years, I've met lots and lots of Nelsons. And uh, made me feel really good. Um, Laura posted uh, a picture of me um, yesterday talking about the anniversary event today. And uh, there was a comment from a member of the Nelson family who said that uh, I'm really dear to their family. That made me feel really, really good. And uh, now I'm kind of related to them because uh, my uh, grandson, Ollie, is the great, great, great nephew of Nels Nelson. <laughs> His great grandmother was, uh, was a niece. Um, so, um, and in fact, um, this is uh, Jean, and when she passed away, her family donated this uh, beautiful coffee uh, set that's at the top of the stairs in the case that uh, had been won by uh, by Nels at an event in Leavenworth, Washington. And uh, she had said that she wanted that to come to the museum after her passing, so the family donated it here. And I told them that, that at that time that my son-in-law was related to the Nelsons. So they decided that I'm one of them and I'm perfectly okay with that. I'm an honorary Nelson. <laughs> and again, there's the work of Rob Buchanan, you know, and uh, the team at Parks Canada, this uh, incredible work that they've done in interpretation. They call that Nels Knickers. So you can actually stand in there and lean in as if you're going to be, uh, as if you're doing the jump yourself. So it's really tremendous uh, exhibit work. Um, so it was my 30th anniversary back in uh, 2013. And uh, I got to be the subject of uh, a Rob Buchanan cartoon, which made me very happy. So he's got um, said from happy 30th from all your friends both now and then. So this is Earl and Estelle Dickey, the photographers. and. Um, saying smile and then this is representing guy barber who was um real kind of man of man around town in the early days of revelstoke and um we he's kind of our, he's our honorary museum ghost because i uh, came in one day and there was a picture of him that uh, had was in a different place than when i'd seen it when i was last in we found we later found uh, a reason for that but at the time you know we decided that he was haunting the museum so he became our our, our ghost but uh, uh, Rob has him saying, so do you come here often? And I say, oh, please, Mr. Barber, can't you come up with a more contemporary line? That's so yesterday. <laughs> and then this is uh, Major Rogers of Rogers Pass, who was uh, known for like uh, spitting all the time. So I uh, said, and Mr. Major Rogers, could you please use the spittoon provided? And he said, um, this floor seems perfectly suitable. And then we have uh, Judge Begbie saying, I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> and then sitting quietly in the corner is Nels Nelson. So um, I'm always very, very happy when I get to be the subject of a Rob cartoon. <laughs> um, one of the, I think one of the most important things that we've done is connected uh, the museum with the history of the Sinaiq's people. Uh, when I first started working here, we were saying, you know, people were saying, oh, there was no indigenous presence here. They didn't like the snow and they were afraid of the mountains and um, just discovered over the years that that just wasn't true. But they'd been displaced from their land so long that it was easier for their history here to be for forgotten. So um, it was probably about around the year 2000 uh, that I started to learn more about the history of the Sinaiaks. And it was really through, in the more recent years, meeting with uh, uh, Virgil Seymour and Shelley Boyd, who both held the position of uh, uh, coordinator or, uh, from the Colville, uh, Colville Confederated Tribes uh, and, and the 
places in Canada that was part of their traditional territory that we were really able to sort of make that story come alive. And Virgil was really instrumental in the exhibit that we have downstairs. And he died just a couple of weeks before we opened the exhibit of uh, leukemia. And then Shelley took over the position. Uh, but um, it's, I think it's probably one of the most important things that we've done here is really uh, bring that history back to life. And um, one of the things that Virgil was really, really wanting to see in the exhibit was their language. He wanted the language to be heard here. So we have the greeting from, uh, we can press the button and hear a greeting from a Sinaiq child um, and greet in her language and then in English and then some language uh, videos there as well. Uh, so um, it's ongoing, you know, it's something that we're, we're continuing working on that relationship with the Sinaiq, but um, we're happy that we've been able to, to make a start on that and really get as far as we have. Uh, the, the exhibit opened in uh, 2016. And a lot of those elements are there because Virgil wanted them there. This, he said he wanted us to talk about the, the salmon, which are no longer running on the Columbia River. He wanted us to include this uh, piece by, uh, by Chief Bernard. Um, and so it, it was really led, led by, by him and by the nation. Another thing that's been really important to, to me was the uh, creation of the film, A Kiss in the Wind. And it started with a phone call from the filmmaker, Nicola, who had discovered that his great grandfather had died in the building of the Connaught Tunnel in 1915. And the, the Angelo Conte, his uh, great grandfather had come to Canada to work, but his wife had stayed in Italy and had her, had the baby girl after Nicola had, or after Angelo had come to Canada. And um, Nicola had recently come into possession of uh, letters that were written by his great grandfather to his great grandmother, and they would end with "I send you a kiss in the wind." So he is a he is a filmmaker, is a professional filmmaker. So he came to Revelstoke to do this film, and. Um, we did a premiere of it at the Performing Arts Center in, in 2017. And every year now, Jacqueline Daniluk and I go up to Angelo's grave on October 15th, which was his date of death and take flowers and then send pictures to Nicola. So we've continued that connection as well. So it's all, all those connections and, and being able to continue those connections and keep them alive, that's been really important. Um, this was this was absolute fun. This was the suffragettes tea in uh, June 2017. We worked with Anita Hallowas and the uh, the Lion Arrow Productions, and uh, she took our, the historic material and wrote a script. So we had the suffragettes who um, had their all their signs made up, and they uh, came through. They walked through Grizzly Plaza and through the farmers market. Uh, really surprised a lot of people who weren't <laughs> expecting to see suffragettes on, when they were out buying the vegetables. And they paraded down to where we had a tea going on and where we had Graham Harper representing the premier of BC giving a, a speech and the suffragettes came and interrupted him. And uh, we had a couple of, we had a plant in the audience. Uh, Andy Parkin was an anti-suffragist who was uh, heckling all the suffragists from the from the tea tent, and uh, Kelly Zerba was a, 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 a fire and brimstone minister who was against women's suffrage. Um, so, uh, and I love this picture here. We've got Joe McLaughlin getting very riled up about the, <laughs> the the cause of women's suffrage. Just super super fun event, and uh, they actually did it twice because we did two sittings at the tea. So the the actors were were superb. We even had um, little York Parkin as the um, the male, uh, the, the newspaper boy, and he was handing out a little flyer that we'd made for the event too. So just absolutely incredibly fun. Um, we had to take a little bit of a, a, a turn on that one because we had a, um, Haley, you were involved in that one too. We'd arranged for a, um, not a barbershop quartet, but a women's quartet to come from the Okanagan to perform and they were going to be singing when the suffragettes would come and interrupt them. 
but there was a, a flash flood and uh, flooding on the highway, washouts, and they couldn't make it here. So we had to do a quick turnaround and, and get uh, Graham to be the one that was interrupted. So it was a lesson in, in doing a quick change when you have to, when things don't go the way you'd planned. Um, then we reprised our suffragettes for the Canada Day Parade that year as well and won second place. Uh, and the fun thing is when we were walking along uh, Mackenzie Avenue, Andy Parkin was in the crowd and he was heckling us again. So he was, uh, stayed in stayed in roll. <laughs> uh, another really important thing has been, I've been doing cemetery tours probably for well over 30 years now. And one of the stories that always kind of hit me when we were there was the story of Jenny Kiyohara. Uh, she was actually murdered in Revelstoke in uh, 1905, uh, and it was a Japanese prostitute. And uh, dug into her story, found a lot of, of information about it. It was actually taken on as a Luna project, and the artist Sarah Spur did an animation. And that animation is available on the Arts Revelstoke website and actually on, on our website as well. And as part of the project, we wanted to uh, redo her marker. We wanted to keep, this is the original marker, but it was on a base of uh, sandstone that was actually eroding away. You could see over the years how much it, it eroded. So this is the new marker that's up there now. And it's really honoring her memory and telling her story a little bit more. Because all it says on there is Jenny Japanese. And that was part of you know what made, made it a compelling story. You know, it was the story of somebody who was marginalized, both as a, you know, a Japanese woman and as a prostitute. And uh, just we thought it was really important to be able to tell that story too. Uh, the, another uh, really exciting project we did uh, was the um, filming of Washed Away. Uh, we worked with uh, filmmaker Agat Bernard to do that. So we did quite a few interviews and we actually did a field trip down to Castlegar and got permission to go on Hugh Keenly's side down and film a load of logs going through the locks and a couple of uh, kayaker uh, and uh, going through the locks as well. Um, so that whole trip was really neat. We stopped off in um, Harrop to interview Eileen Perks who wrote the book uh, River Captured and she's a really important part of the, the film. And then we stopped at Shelter Bay and interviewed uh, Shelley Boyd. And that photograph of Shelley was the one that, that Agat took at uh, when we were filming filming Shelley that day. Um, and a fun part of, uh, like, uh, Agat had her drone there, and I've got pictures of uh, having her drone up and her drone being attacked by swallows. We wow. didn't like the drone, so she was, she was a little afraid that her, her drone camera was going to end up in the lock, but luckily uh, it didn't. And uh, of course, I've done a couple of book launches. And again, they both involve cakes uh, by Jose. Um, this was the, the first book in 2015. Uh, Rob Buchanan did the cartoons in it. Carly Moran was the book designer. And then the second book was in 2018. And I see that um, Jose talked me into making a mini crocheted me for that. And I see she stole it and resurrected it for this one as well. <laughs> Um, and then the stories beneath the surface, that was, um, I started to think about, you know, people would would ask about, people would talk about going down on the flats and people would talk about, you know, uh, like going going out there. And, and I'd had people say to me that the fluctuation of the water was caused by the Revelstoke Dam, which is north of the flats, and realized that people didn't really understand the land here and the history of the land and decided it was really important to tell the story of the Hugh Kingley side dam and the creation of the Arrow Lakes Reservoir all the way up to Revelstoke and the impact that it had on the 2000 people who were displaced from the valley and the, all the, the land, the changes to the landscape. So that uh, resulted in the exhibit that we've got here now, Stories Beneath the Surface. And uh, then the, the film Washed Away came out, out of that and then we're currently also doing an online exhibit on stories beneath the surface and a book. So those should be out uh, this year. Just felt it was a really important story. And I think people have really appreciated the, the information that, uh, and the way that it's presented. We had um, uh, uh, Maris Gayak 
her son, uh, Brian, I think uh, Ron's there too, uh, helping to unveil the exhibit because uh, <clears throat> they were very affected <clears throat> by uh, by the the dam and uh, we have an interview by them as well. So this has been really important uh, work to record those stories too. Um, we had a fun event in um, the 120th anniversary of Revel Stokes Incorporation uh, called uh, Citified and Mystified. And I had a lot of people playing uh, different characters. We did a little uh, little uh, mystery. And um, this was a, a, a young woman who had come in that day to get her costume and had this beautiful long flowing blonde hair. And then she showed up that evening with her hair back and a mustache. Um, but the actors really got into the roles, had super lots of fun with it. It was just a super, really, really fun event. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do in the last little while is connect with the 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 the, early, the Japanese community. Um, with uh, Harumi working here, she's been able to do a lot of research. We've been able to gather information from uh, the families that lived here both before and during the war. And one of the stories that I found really fascinating was discovered through some research, and it actually came from a query from um, Tomo. Um, of Fujimura, who's done a lot of research with us and a lot of work on the 1910 project. And uh, he had information about uh, somebody from the Amano family who had died. So I did a bit more research into it and discovered that they had actually had a soy manufacturing business in Revelstoke. And in fact, in the, the space where Mark and Pat just built their new building on 2nd Street West, that was uh, the old building that was there that became the, the meat lockers and part of the red and white store, that was actually, uh, was running as a soy factory. And um, through the research, we uh, were able to contact, so the younger son of the family, Shigeru, went to high school here. And this is his son, Graham, and his wife, Linda, who still are manufacturing miso and soy products under the name Amano in Vancouver. And he didn't really know anything about the the Revelstoke connection, so I was we were able to share information and and pull that story together too. So that's another one that's been was really exciting to make that connection. Um, this was uh, an event that we at, at Parks Canada. They'd use some of our historic photos with their green screen, and so there's Susan Black and Jacqueline Danlock and me on top of an old uh, an old rotary snowplow. <laughs> And I'll end with this one of uh, Ken and I on Mackenzie Avenue in 1912. <laughs> um, this was an event that they had at the community center on um, to celebrate the 120th anniversary of the incorporation of Revelstoke. So that was a, a fun event. So that's what I've been, a little bit of what I've been doing over the last uh, last 40 years. Um, we're continuing our the big thing that we're working on now is something that we're really excited about. Um, Bill and uh, Jan and all of our board are really involved in working to get a vertical platform left. So um, by hopefully by the end of uh, by the end of this year, we will you will be able to come in on the lift through the back uh, back parking lot and come to both the first and the second floor. Like uh, the bottom floor, it will come in. To the parlor and the second floor will come in uh, where the men's washroom is right now and we'll have uh, a, a um, fully accessible washroom on each floor so that's the project we're we're working on now we've got an event planned for february 3rd from three to seven a little drop in we'll be doing an online auction uh, kicking off an online auction that day as well so encourage people to to come to that and then there's we've got our brown bag history schedule up and um, the the one on March 27th is um, the Teddy Glacier Mine at Camborn. Doing that one because we got in this uh, collection of photographs that's uh, absolutely outstanding. They're just really amazing photographs of the the family that started the Teddy Glacier Mine in the 20s and then in, in the 30s, and uh, absolutely incredible, very very good photographs, better than most sort of family albums that come into the museum. The quality of photography is really outstanding. So that, that one should be fun to do. 
Uh, we're also doing a thing on Fridays, every other Friday called Film Friday. The one on the 26th is on The Silent Barrier, which if you haven't seen it, it's quite a hilarious film, filmed in Revelstoke in 1936. And uh, the sound is terrible, but it's very cheesy and really fun. And uh, so that's, that's it. So uh, thank you for coming. Thank you.